I mean, uh, I'm, before I get started, what I'm going to do is I'm going to point out some references. Uh, Jaime wanted me to talk about site preparation, and I'm going to talk about site preparation, but I'm going to talk about a couple of other issues, too. And um, it's, it's not like you have to start from scratch on a lot of these things. There's a lot of resources out there. There, there are people, uh, there are people in the agencies, um, there's a group, South Texas Natives that were involved with, they have a great website, and I'd highly recommend uh, t checking that out. And there's a couple of books. Yeah. That I want you to look at. There's one that's called the Tall Grass. John, what's the title of it? It's uh, called Red Bird Center Guide to Prairie Restoration in the Upper Midwest. It's uh, probably Iowa Press, I think. It's a great book. And if you can look at these when I'm done, I'll uh, Then, of course, there's the Restoration Manual for the Native Habitats of South Texas. Uh, we were involved uh, closely in putting this together. It's pretty good, too. It's a lot more local, but uh, I still kind of like that. <laughs> Manual for Native Habitats of South Texas. If you have property in South Texas, you probably ought to have a copy of this. And South Texas, well, I'll define that in a slide as far as an eco region, but it's basically, you know, uh, oh, south of uh, San Antonio, uh, west of Corpus, east of uh, Laredo, north of uh, Brownsville. Yeah, it is absolutely right. Yeah. The other book, oh, the other is if you don't really want to spend some money for an actual manual, you can download these, and these are the general guidelines for native seeding in South Texas. You can just, and this is a good. I mean, it goes from the very beginning for of uh, you know uh, talking about site preparation all the way to management, you know, whether livestock, fire, all those different issues. So it's a, you know it's a pretty concise eighteen pages free I would highly recommend downloading it so with that said well then so if I do a poor job you can go to these other resources and you'll still be fine <laughs> Okay, um, like Jaime said, um, I'm with the USDA Natural Resource Conservation Services Plant Materials Center. Whoops, I'm not used to using a microphone. I don't use it, <laughs> but, um, and we're, we're located out of Kingsville. Whoops. All right. So I'm gonna talk. Can, can you hear me all right if I just yell? No. Oh, damn. <laughs> all right. Okay. Um, I'm gonna talk about the importance of site preparation and a couple other issues. Okay. As I mentioned, I'm with a I'm with a plant material center. It's a federal program through USDA. There's 27 plant material centers across the nation currently. Uh, there's things on the books as far as reducing these centers. Um, because of budgets and everything else, but for right now there's 27 of them, and uh, we deal with um, plant releases and plant technology, and it's not just prairie restoration. Uh, coastal restoration, I've done a lot of work with like dune restoration, I've done uh, like bays and um, estuaries as far as coastal work there. A lot of you, some of you may be familiar like with smooth cord grass or, or Eddie Seiden sticker here up in this area, and a lot of work he did. We do the similar sort of stuff down in Corpus. 
Um, and most of our work is done with native plants. On the East Coast, it's, you know, there's a lot of uh, kind of uh, naturalized species, I would say, but uh, out west, uh, everything's pretty much native. We work closely with South Texas Natives, and South Texas Natives is a program through Texas A&M University at Kingsville, uh, the Caesar Clayburg Wildlife Research Institute, in about, oh, I'd say 2001, yeah, it was 2001. Um, we put together this, um, it, and basically it was an effort by landowners who were concerned about, um, you know, uh, introduced species, especially through highway development, highway work, uh, coming onto their lands, and then not having, and the, the answer by the highway department is saying, well, there wasn't any commercial sources, so, you know, we're, we're seeding buffalo grass or we're seeding claybird blue stem. And they didn't want to see it anymore. So there was a meeting in San Antonio, and they said, well, you know, we'll help support, you know, an initiative. And so they supported some funds. And, uh, like, within the first two years, um, they, uh, they collected over 1,700 seed collections. And uh, there's one thing I'll say. It's our work is critical is seed collections. It's all about having seed collections because not all collections are the same. And some will have good seed development. They'll have good seed germination, and others won't. And if you don't get those, then you're spending a lot of time collecting the poor seed, and you won't get very far. Okay, the goals and objectives of the South Texas Natives program, which basically we're a co-partner on it, um, is first of all was to develop ecotypic seed. So when I first came down to Kingsville um, in 1992, there, were, there was no seed, uh, native seed for South Texas. Um, the seed that they were using was from, the closest center was Knox City, and so, you know, there was seed development from that was useful in uh, the Edwards Plateau and uh, the High Plains, but it did you know, was not, it wasn't even the species, correct species for South Texas. And so, we started working, and uh, 20 years later, we have 24 releases that are available on the commercial market so you know that's that's where you know you can kind of take um, you know a, a belief in is that you know if you do those collections and you put a little effort I think you know we'll see and, and we've come a long ways already because we've done a lot of work in South Texas and we're working on the coast that within the next five to ten years you'll have 10 to 15 different species available on the commercial market we're going to release brown seed past palum next year. So uh, that's a reason for hope that you know we will develop the seeking tip of seed for the coast and uh, we can do it that much faster and better if we can get collections from you guys. But the other two items were effective planning strategies, which is what we'll kind of talk about here today. And then the last being an education program, which this is kind of in all group. But when we talk about ecoregions, basically, uh, you'll be familiar with it. It's like the hill country, the Gulf Coast, um, the South Texas Plains, uh, Piney Woods. Those are the ecoregions we're talking about. And the reason we use ecoregions is that it's an area that's big enough that the commercial grower can, can grow the seed and there's enough people that will buy it, so there's a big enough demand for the seed. But it's not so big that you lose the genetic integrity and inheritability of that seed you know for a, a certain area you know obviously if you can get a native prairie that's right next door that's kind of the perfect situation though with global climate change it kind of puts a whole new twist on all of this now um, but um, that's why even I think the eco regions is even better because like with South Texas we're getting from Corpus all the way over to Laredo so we get also the dry extremes so that when the when corpus turns into Laredo, we'll still have seed that's useful. But uh, anyway, it's something to keep in mind. But that eco regions gives you a, a larger, a large enough area for diversity, but still a commercial uh, product. Okay, prairie restoration. If you're starting to think about, you know, planting and all the efforts and costs to go involved in it, the first thing you've got to ask yourself is, what do you have there existing? 
primary seeding is usually not necessary if there's 15 to 25 percent of your native per species composition and it's well distributed. If you man you can manage that to bring to bring that numbers up, you know. Um, and so, you know, but there's, you, you really want to think hard. If you've got, you know, an existing composition that's pretty decent, you really want to think about whether or not you can just do management rather than starting to disturb the soil, kill plants, and all that, because that's going to be costly, and, you know, it may be, there may be a less costly, less damaging, so I'll keep that in mind. I'm going to keep that. Okay, when do you plant seed? If the native seed bank is absent, okay, after cropland, you know, of rice fields that are abandoned, those aren't going to have any kind of uh, uh, native seed um, residual in the soil, so you're going to have to start from scratch there. Highway department, you know, when you're dealing with roadsides, they're not going to have any native seed there. Um, if you're in slow vegetative recovery, if you've had an intense wildfire, um, you know, you may, it may be so hot that it then basically kills any seed that's in the soil, so you need to start from scratch there. I keep hitting it, right? Our pond embankments, things like that, you're also going to want to do those, you know, because erosion control, you want to get a seed establishing quickly. Control invasive species, so and, and that ends up being problematic throughout you know anything we do nowadays because there's so many introduced exotic species that are surrounding you that you've got to think hard that when you if you just kind of rely on whether or not the seed there's stuff in the seed bank that will come back how fast it is if it's too slow those introduced species will get a foothold and uh, you know you go from having like five or ten percent of the exotic to all of a sudden 30 or 40 percent, you know, especially like after a burn or something, something like that, you can go back the next year and sometimes it's just amazing. So you have to be really careful. And then, you know, plant diversity. If you don't have a lot of diverse species, you're going to probably want to at least intersee maybe some other species to get that diversity and improve that wildlife habitat. Okay, critical concerns for prairie restoration. This is where it was more than just seed prep. These are things that I wanted to kind of talk about. Land use history, the site attributes, site preparation, planting method and date, seed mixture, post-planting rainfall, and post-planting management. Those last two I'm not going to try to handle, but I, will, I am going to try to address the first five. Uh, Okay, these recommendations that I'm going to give you, they're based on about 30 different plantings that we've done across South Texas. We all, we used South Texas origin seed. These were all seedings that were done with South Texas ecotype seed that we eventually, or is commercially available. Um, the success was defined as either a half a plant per square foot in the first two years, or greater than 30% seeded plant cover by one year after sowing. And basically, we had an overall success rate at 70%. And when I first got, I mean, to have a success rate at 70%, it, it, you know, it's not 100%, it's not a sure thing, but that's pretty good numbers because before that, I mean, we were lucky if we could get 10 or 20% you know, success rate. And that's why when I first came to South Texas, natives had such a, whoops. Natives had such a bad rap because we were using seed that was outside our adaptability range and they were, it was being a failure. Oops. Okay, land use history. On retired cropland, we've only had about a 50% success rate. Degraded native sites, we've had about an 83% success rate. And exotic grass diversification, that is like monocultures of, let's say, buffalo grass or something like that. We've added natives in strips and stuff like that. We've had about a 75% success rate. And I'm going to go through these and talk about some of the issues that, uh, why or why they weren't successful. Okay, retired cropland. 
The success rate has been modest, and mainly for the retired crop, and there's two things that we run into, is that the weed competition hasn't been taken care of enough. Um, it's like only had one year of, let's say, weed um, um, management and such that they end up being a problem. The other thing is, is that the seed beds always end up not being adequate. You need a nice, firm, clean seed bed, and we get one of two things. We either get a sandy soil that has been beaten up and it's fluffed up and it's just too airy, and so when you actually put the seed in, it ends up getting buried. Um, the other issue is on clay soil, it ends up being clotty, and so like they'll just run a disc, they won't run a, a cultivator a couple times to clean it up and get it nice and smooth, and so when it's being real cloudy like that, you just don't get good seed contact, good seed soil contact. Exotic grass pastures, we've had pretty good rate, um, success rate. We haven't eliminated that introduced species, we've just diversified it. And so we've, we've done that, but it requires good post management because if not handled correctly, then you know, that introduced species could end up taking it over. So it may not be a long-term strategy, it may be more of a short-term strategy, like a five, five year, 10 year horizon, where it's kind of like brush control, where you, know, you treat the brush and you have a certain period of time where it's adequately treated before it becomes a problem again and you have to treat it again. That may be the case with diversification of these monocultures. On degraded rangeland, this we generally have pretty good success with this because there's there's not a whole lot you have to do to add species to it. You get a firm, you got a nice firm seed bed. You're just no, using a no-till drill to put to add species to it, and so that's a, a, a real problem. And so um, between the and the seed bed's already firm because you don't um, treat it other than uh, herbicides for killing some of the unwanted species. Okay, site attributes. Uh, there's a couple of things. How you manage them is going to be different. The topography, you know, is how many does it have swales? Does it have caliche ridges? All of those come into, you know, a factor of how what your seed mix is and how you're going to treat it. Okay, and then the other thing is the existing vegetation, and this is really the important part because a lot of your success rate will be. It's kind of like painting. You know, everybody wants to get to painting because that's where you really see the results. But your success of having a good paint job is all in the site prep. All in the sanding, you know, you know, getting all the chip paint out of there, you know. And, and you hate doing that, but if you do a good job on that, that's, that painting will last a lot longer. Well, it's the same thing with seeding, you know. If you do a good site prep, You'll, have, you'll get a good stand that'll last for a long time. If you don't, and within two or three years, you're going to be back to where you were in the beginning. And it's costly. I mean, you're talking, you know, just in seed costs, $50 an acre. So, I mean, it's not something you want to do high, you know, uh, with, you know, that it's not adequate. You want to do a good job. And so, the first thing you need to do is make sure you, you handle the competition. So how are you going to do that? There's basically three ways we do that. One is with deep tillage, that's mulber plowing. If you're, you know, you've got a deep soil, it likes a nice ag farm soil, and you don't have hillsides that you have to worry about erosion, a mulber plow, it will come in, it will flip the soil over, it will bury those seeds, and it does a great job of handling the competition. But it's a very aggressive, and it takes a high-powered tractor to pull them over a plow. The other thing is herbicides. Herbicides will kill weeds. You know, you can use multiple applications of Roundup, but it requires good timing if you have, seed, you know, a plant that has uh, like like Bermuda grass or kale blue stem. Some of those, because you spray them, they will have uh, dormant um, tillers that will not translocate the herbicide and so you're going to have to do it multiple times and you're going to have to pay attention to that. There are herbicides but they're more uh, aggressive or you know like tebuthyron that you could put down once but it's a more expensive herbicide and you know it's a little more um, you know uh, I don't know sensitive. And then the other one is, is cover crops, and the cover crops are a really nice way because, you know, you can use a cover crop 
like wheat for winter and sorghum during the summer, and that gives you time with that crop to get control of your weeds. It, and it's, so you get your firm, clean seed bed by farming, and you get an economic return, you know, in some cases where you can actually harvest the wheat or harvest the sorghum, and so that will help defray some of the costs you have involved with um, the site prep, and you get a better site prep, it allows you to con start controlling those weeds, and you can do it over a one to two year period, um, and so that when you finally get around to planting your seed, it's in better shape. It's especially useful like hard to kill exotics like Bermuda grass, uh, buffalo grass, clover blue stem, because it gives you more time to adequately treat them. Okay, site preparation methods. Double disking only was the site preparation method for most failed plantings. So you can't just go in there and just double disk. Double disking does not give you the depth or the adequate control. Basically, it just kind of rolls over. I mean, it just does. Even you know, um, you know, it, it, you just got to have to use something more aggressive than that. You either got to combine it with herbicides, or you're going to have to use some plow then disking and then cultivating. Okay, there's a lot of information on this one. Let's say most of the time people want to do the site preparation and get ready within just a couple of months of wanting to plant. You really need to give at least a year, sometimes two years, because the longer time, basically you're not in so much of a hurry trying to get everything done, and, and when you start doing it under that scenario, you do, do an adequate job. So I'd like to emphasize you know, trying to do it over a one, year, at least a full year period, and maybe even two year period, especially if you're using a cover crop. Because again, I'm going to emphasize controlling the weed seed bank is critically important. I mean, if you can get that under control, you've won most of the war. Um, you can add other, um, you know, disturbances or whatever to help you get there. Fire can be useful. Um, grazing can be useful. Um, you know, in combination, you know, with them. But basically, you're trying to get that weed competition under control. Deep tillage followed by repeated shallow cultivations over long, wet intervals is the most successful control of exotics. And I'd say that that's a pretty good one for you guys here because in South Texas, we don't usually have wet intervals. But here, you can kind of count on those wet intervals. You know, take those root reserves, those plants come up again, and then you knock them back again with a tillage treatment and such that you do that a couple of times and pretty soon they're worn out and your weeds are, uh, are, are under control. Um, repeated low rate applications of glyphosate uh, are useful, and especially in no-tilling, but you, there's, you've got to make sure those timings of those are, are correct or they'll get, the weeds will get up and uh, get a, a, a head in you because you got to do it like every time it's like six to nine inches tall. You know, if it starts getting taller than that, then the, the roundup doesn't, isn't as effective and so you're, and then you can spray four or five times and be wasting your money, so you got to be real careful on the time into those. Okay, seabed conditions. This is what you're trying to get at. You want 100%, we had 100% success when we had firm aggregated seabeds. And I'll show you a picture of a good one and a bad one. Failed seedings were in cloddy, uneven seabeds. That's basically your clay soils. You saw that on that type one, the crop, retired crop plant. Or loose, fluffy seabeds. Because with the sea, you know, the sandy soils, if you come in there and just going to cultivate them, you get a lot of air in them. They'll, and they'll, they'll, it'll be like five or six inches. When you, when you come in with a cultipacker, it'll press down five or six inches. Well, if you fluff it up that much and you put that seed on, and then you press it, you that soil down. You're going to bury that seed, and so you know. And these, most of these native seeds are small, very small. They need to be planted about an eighth of an inch deep. And so, if you get that condition, you put those seeds on there, you're going to bury them, and then you've wasted your money. If it's cloudy, like the clay soils. Basically, you have such an irregularity that your drill cannot place the seed at the right depth, and and you make it very hard, you know, for that seed to soil. Contact. Contact. Oh, yeah, you can't even see this. <laughs> um, 
Well, it's too bad because actually this is the seed bed conditions though, that I wanted. What I guess you can imagine them, you know. Um, but basically what you're trying to, the one on the left is basically, it looks like a garden. I mean, if you, that's really what you're, if you're going to use tillage, when you're done with it, you're, you basically want that soil to look like a garden. And such that when you walk out there in flip-flops, all you see is a little bit of your footprint, it, you know, and not a deep footprint. Just barely seeing an impression. It's that firm and it's not irregular. I mean, it's just, it's almost like a sidewalk. I mean, and so what you have have to do is, is you can't just run in there with a with, and even if you use a mobile plow and then you disc it you gotta disc it and then you gotta cultivate it a couple times it's those cultivations that will get you that condition and that one on the right is basically it's more like a fire lane basically it's just been come in and disc it it's cloudy and you're not going to have a good success with that if you can't do that then basically you go to no-till because no-till you spray and you either graze or you use fire to get the vegetation down, you already will have a firm seed bed. And so it will be firm but with dead vegetation. Oops. Oh well what have I done now? How that help? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, that's good. I don't know if you can. Uh, go back one. Okay, yeah, I guess you're still not going to see it. Okay, no. Okay. Well, as, as far as the seed big, I mean, I think you, if you have a question about what it should look like, I mean, you can either ask me or, or look in some of these books, but you, you, you kind of get a sense of what I'm talking about with a firm seed bed. So, okay, and once you have that, then you're talking the planting method. Uh, basically, you have broadcast seed or you have a drill, and you can have a grain drill that basically has a level platform, or you have a range drill where each one of the seed units has its own spring can go up and down. And so when you're dealing with irregular topography, um, the range line drill with each one of those units being independent is important because otherwise what will happen is as soon as you get a little bit of irregularity in, in like a cultipac or like a, um, a brilliant seeder or even a grain drill, it'll end up angling like this. And so the one that's here will press in and it'll be too deep and the other seed unit is going to be up here in the air and it's not going to be seeding correctly. And that's the problem with just a grain drill or a brilliant seeder versus a no-till drill that will actually have independent units that can move up and down. And we've had 100% success rate using those no-till drills. Broadcast seeding, um, it can be it can be effective, but you have to really make sure that your site preparation is effective. You also can end up you know broadcasting your. It's hard to calibrate a broadcaster. A lot easier to calibrate the seed, which is expensive seed. So you want to don't want to be just you know tossing it around. Broadcasting is not it's not easy to calibrate it. The planting depths, dates. Now, these are probably going to vary a little bit for you guys versus us in South Texas. We found that February, 0% success rate. In March and April in the spring, we had, you know, fair 50% or so, but our most effective dates were in the fall. And it's, that's become even more uh, um, the, the the, the norm because we're not we're not having frost anymore. We rarely get a frost, a killing frost in South Texas. And so and we're going into periods with reduced evapotranspiration rates when we plant in the fall versus in the spring we're going into increased evapotranspiration rates. So things are just getting worse for that little seedling when they're planted in the spring. So if your conditions are such um, I you know for, certainly in South Texas, I only 
strongly recommend fall planting. Here, because you can't, you will probably get frost. You either got to plant farther, like into probably that August period, early August, so that you, your plants will develop and have some sort of root development before a frost will come. But I also, and I, and I don't know if this is the case here, but in South Texas, I looked at the last 20 year history and we have a bi, what they call a bimodal pattern, a spring and a fall rainfall pattern, but we've only reached the 50%, actually less than 50% of the time over the last 20 years have we gotten the average spring precipitation. The fall precipitation, we've gotten that 70 or 80% of the time, so you've got a, chance, a bigger chance that you're going to get that adequate moisture in the fall. In the spring, we're, we're not even getting the average precipitation and uh, the odds are become less and less. Oops. Can I go back? <laughs> Okay, in some way, I basically want to say that competition needs to be eliminated. You got to get your weeds under control. Good seed bed preparation must be done, and that is so that the seed must have good seed to soil contact. Seed must be planted at the right time. You don't want to be planting in the dead of, in the middle of summer, and you don't want to be planting in January or December either. And you want to use good quality adapted seed must be planted. And I'm going to talk about that last one a little bit. Okay, South Texas Manus Restoration Seed Mixes. We, we focus on a, a, what we call functional groups. And what I mean by functional groups is a, a warm season grass is a functional group. A cool season grass is a functional group. Perennials, annuals. So we have annual summer, and annual um, winter. We have forbs, we have legumes, and we have grasses. So you have about six different categories there. I like to have all of those in there, and I like to have quite a few early successional species because you're talking about a really early successional, you know, um, um, soil and everything. The, the microbial is early successional, the vegetations, and those other late successional climax species, they're not going to come in right from the beginning. But if you can get a couple of those established, and then as and, and the rest of it has those early successional species, you'll get that cover, you'll get that silver development that will allow those um, late successional species to expand and, and you know, basically they'll take over the early successional species and you'll get the um, kind of vegetation you want. You want to select for genetic and environmental adaptation. Uh, we work on so that they're grower and user friendly, and that is, I, I like seed, we work on seed, can I plant it, can I harvest, can I process it, and can I maintain it? All of those, if you're going to, to produce commercial seed, you have to answer those questions. There's some seed, you know, there are some plants that are really good plants, but they don't fit into that commercial production for seed development. They're more suited towards nursery, and, uh, you know, sometimes I talk about, you know, people do food plots, or I talk about diversity plots. Sometimes it's a small plot that you may be put in by plugs that may be some of these plants that are preferred for wildlife or pollinators or whatever. You put those in plugs and they'll expand every year producing seed on their own, but they don't have to be commercial seed development. You know, so you know, not every plant fits this mold and we primarily focus on large acreage plants that we can get seed from. And we release them only after they've been proven successful. They have to have good germination, good viability. We know that the grower is going to have a success and that the landowners will too. Okay, and so this is how, what we like to see is we like that early successional mix of grasses and annual forbs and legumes. We want that to be 50% of your seed mix. And then you're going to look at mid-successional grasses for about 25% or so. And then late successional species is the next 25%. So let's talk about the Texas coast. This might be some of the early successional species that you would want to have for the Texas coast. Not root bristle grass, silver blue stem, fall panicum, red love grass, purple top. 
Virginia Raw Rye all the way down to Brown Sea Pass Palum. That's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's nine different species. And partridge pea is a, and then there's also quite a few annual forbs that we have. Okay, well, what's the coastal, you know, Heine talked about the coastal prairie seed collection efforts. Okay, early successional species. We're in the process of collecting not root bristle grass. Silver blue stem. We, at the Plant Material Center, have been working on this issue for 10 years. The same time we started South Texas Natives, there were some of us, Terry Rajon, Thomas Adams, I think some of, a few other uh, people, were at that original meeting, I think it was in Rural, Watch, I can't remember one of the cities up here, but um, we met 10 years ago and said, okay, we want to get some collections, and so we've been working on this issue. We've had some of this plant material, but we've only had about 200 collections versus 2,000 for South Texas natives. But silver blue stem, we have about five different lines of that, and we're in seed increase, and probably within the next two or three years, we'll be releasing a silver blue stem. Fall Panico, um, we, we haven't done anything with it, and I'm not sure if it's on the collection list or not. Red Love Grass, that's, that's a great early successional species. We have that in increase too. We have a couple of lines of accessions of that that have come from the coast, and that's going to be a really important one, I think, for that early successional mix. Uh, purple top, you can get that commercially, but it's not an ecotype. Virginia wild rye, we're collecting it, but we do have a Canada wild rye that we've released that's from La Vaca County, so that's, um, that could be used. Texas winter grass, meadow drop seed, we're collecting that. Brown seed pass palum, we have that up at East Texas. In seed increase, we'll probably be releasing that next year. So that's one, two, at least three that are in seed increase that will probably be released in the next uh, two or three years, and then we're collecting on some of the others. So, you know, we've we've got a good head start, and uh, we should have some species pretty quick here for you. Uh, and then on the late successional species, uh, we're talking about uh, seacoast bluestem, Indian grass, switchgrass, you know, basically your big uh, tall grass prairie species, along with beak panicum and long spike tridents. As far as what we are going, um, this is good news because up until probably this date today, I couldn't have told you that we were getting very much. We've had plants down at the center for probably a good eight to 10 years, but we've had poor seed fill. I mean, virtually no seed fill. And part of the reason, uh, it's conjecture on my part, is, is that in Kingsville, in the summertime, it's basically the same day after day for months after months. We don't get thunderstorms to come in and cool off temperatures. So Texas species are what we call apomictic or self-fertilizing type species. So we don't really have a problem with those that are adapted for South Texas around Kingsville. But the coast is, is what you call a more cross-pollinating species, tallgrass prairie, you know, and what they do is when that pollination, go through that pollination period, in the, in, even at nighttime, we're talking about uh, above 80 degrees in Kingsville, and that's too hot for pollination. And so we end up killing the, the pollen, and we don't get good seed fill without good pollination. And so that's the problem there. So what we ended up doing is we started taking plant material that we evaluated. We sent it up to Baytown, where we have a little satellite facility with Scott Alford. We also sent it up to East Texas at Nagadoches, and we also sent it to Knox City. And that was a breakthrough because we started seeing, because they do have thunderstorms that cool off temperatures every week or so, and they started getting, and we started getting seed fill. So we now have numbers like Seacoast Blue Stem. We have two accessions, one from Calhoun County and one from San Patricio County that have germination and seed fill, but it's 23 to 54 percent. 54 percent, that's, that's fantastic. You know, I mean, if I can get 30 percent, I'm pretty damn happy. And so you get up around that, that's really good numbers. Um, especially for a Seacoast Blue Stem, I mean, that's, you know, we really sad, that's a key species. Uh, Indian grass, we have one from Wilson County that has 39%. Um, we have one, this was another big one, Big Blue Stem Noasis, 61%. That is a big number. So, I mean, we're talking some good numbers here, and we're talking, okay, uh, so see Blue Stem, Indian grass, Big Blue Stem. Switchgrass and eastern gamma grass we're collecting on. You can get one from Medina County. Um, 
right now of eastern gamma grass. It's a little bit more difficult to work with. Florida pass bloom, we have one out of Brazoria. Uh, I think uh, Thomas Adams probably collected that one. And uh, that has 23%. And then Beak Panicum and Long Spike Tridents, they're being worked on by East Texas. So you have almost all of those that are uh, probably, you know, within five years to six years or so that will be available. So I think, you know, the coast in the next you know, five to ten years is in good shape, I think. I mean, we're seeing some, we'll see some uh, phenomenal progress. I was just going to talk about what commercial availability of the seed right now. Um, early successional species, I would say, ruby windmill grass, you can get purple top, you can get Canada wild rye, you can get tallow weed, which is planting, planting, which is a cool season, and you can get partridge pea, but that's Comanche. So um, some of them are South Texas more adapted. Uh, we're stretching some of them. So you really, I mean, commercially, you don't really have a whole lot to work with here. And then late succession, uh, you've got more species, but you don't really have the adaptability that you want. you got Indian grass, you have Lamita, which can do okay down here, but I mean, really, that's, you know, that's up around the rolling plains, up around Abilene. Switchgrass, now, that's from Alamo or George West, but it came off a bank of the, whatever river that is, the Guadalupe or whatever, and so it really requires 7 to 14 days of moist soil, so, you know, you guys probably have success, but in South Texas, I only have success one year out of ten planting it, so it's not really that adapted to us. But Eastern Gamma Grass, you have one from Medina County, which is a hill country. You also have some from Austin County, which is you can get, I think, commercially, and uh, that would be probably more adapted for our situation here. Illinois Bundlefly, now this is a good one. It's a great plant, and it came from Beaumont, so that would be a good keeper. And then you have Maximilian Sunflower, which is Aztec, which is again up around Abilene, the Rolling Plains, and same with Ingham and Daisy. So we only have a, you know, a fair uh, amount of commercially available species, and uh, but you do, you know, the, you can get some seed, like through Native American seed, which gets it from the um, Atwater Prairie Preserve, so that's a good one, and uh, Pierce Ranch also sells um, um, bulk seed, and so you might also consider that. So in the end, I really, the recommendations I want to make are use multiple seedbed preparation treatments to create an ideal seedbed and control the seed banks of undesirable plants before planting. That should just be your mantra for a year to get your site ready. And then maximize the diversity of your seed mix by selecting for the various plant functional groups, but be sure to include a large percentage of early successional species. And that's it, the Samelia, which is the seed, it's the continuing challenge, and it's done. So, any questions? Yes? Most of our native seed, it all depends, you know, because some of the seed varies in size. It, Deep tillage, uh, mobile plow probably inverts the soil about 18 inches or so. You know, so yeah, you're talking at least an 18 inch, you know, flipping of the soil. I mean, it, it's burying that seed. You know, just, you know, a disking is only going to go from three to six inches. It's, you know, you're just tossing, moving things back and forth and you're just not, you know, you're chopping things up, but like Bermuda grass, it just likes that, so. Okay, I know. Yeah. Shan? I might point out one other thing too, is, is, is that you know our, our, our target hasn't only been just like like prairie restoration. We've been involved. TexDOT has been involved with this probably at least well 12 years, I guess. 2001 was more or less. They first started funding South Texas natives and continue to uh, fund it. They were first in the South Texas. Now they're working in West Texas, in Central Texas. 
And you know, a key thing for for the highway department is the stature, the height. You know, and uh, you know, we we provided good evidence in South Texas with the windmill grasses and the guama grasses that don't get any taller than three to six inches. That we can provide native species for those highway for those specialized needs without having to use exotics, and we can give you just as good erosion control. We you know, we on the germination numbers on these windmill grasses is three days germination. I mean, we're talking some pretty good stuff, and so we did a study across the state with with windmill grass, and it's just you know we can provide the same amount of uh, coverage, and it can get it meet all your EPA requirements. So I just wanted to point that out that you know within this bigger picture, we can also meet those individual isolated needs, whether it's erosion control, or highway department, or whatever. So yes. Because when you deep this, especially on a, a clay soil, you're going to get a chunk about the size of this chair. And so, you know, you're not going to be able to plant on that. You're going to need something that's going to break that up. And so you're going to let them dry out, and you're going to come through a couple of diskings in order to break that thing down into clods. And then you're going to come in with a cultivator, and you're going to get that fine, you know, granular type of seed that, that you want. Should we all take about a 30 minute break here where we sleep and get something to drink? And, uh, <laughs> One question. When you say you're going to release something, what are you talking about? Okay, well, the, the, the emphasis of our program is, is not, not just to research, you know, what is effective methods or whatever. One of the key things we found out is if you can't go buy that seed, it doesn't, we're not really helping anybody. And so our program goes from the process of collecting that seed, planting that seed, what we call the initial evaluations. We harvest that seed every year. We put it through the germ chamber, look at viability. Then we narrow that down to the, you know, get a good diversity of, of the eco region. And then basically we give, well, we don't, there's this nominal amount of fee that is charged to a commercial dealer. Turner seed, uh, Douglas King seed, um, uh, Pogue seed, all of those have material that, are, that we did the research on. We gave them the starter seed to start their seed increase field so that they can sell you seed so you can use it. And in 2006 is when we released our first plant material. Now in 2013, we have, uh, we, there's over 50,000 pounds of native South Texas seed that is available on the commercial market. It's enough to plant 30,000 acres a year, and we continue to increase that every year. So that's a phenomenal growth. I mean, that curve is just, you know, really steep. I mean, so that's something that you can look forward to. I mean, so it's proven not only if, you know, we can do, we can talk about it, but it's getting done on the land that seed's being bought, it's being used, and it's being successful. And so that's what I mean. Okay.